I've been involved in pollution control systems for close to 30 years now, uh, specifically focused on water and wastewater, uh, basically technology and, and solutions that can be implemented to save water as a resource. The biggest misconception of the current water supply and water availability is that we have a never-ending resource or we have something that is going to replenish itself. If you look at a lot of the uh, articles on subsidence in California, in Nevada, Arizona, we've drained a lot of the aquifers significantly through agriculture and, and uh, uh, commercial and industrial processes. Um, we're using it at a more rapid rate than we used it 20 years ago and we don't seem to be slowing that the curve. We're actually uh, increasing the rate that we're consuming it. If you look at, again, the consumer price index as an example, uh, water and sewer as a commodity versus all other utilities is increasing almost exponentially, much higher than any other utility across the board. And so this should be a telltale sign that we have a problem on our hands and that water and sewer are at the, at the crux or at the peak of that. We need to be aware of that resource and that there is a, a scarcity uh, in that uh, water availability. One of the th things that we've been tasked with is basically educating municipalities on the availability of water and how technology can help mitigate some of the shortages. Unfortunately, a lot of the development is, is uh, predicated on the idea that we have available water resources to last 100 years or more. And that's a scary thing to say because, again, we've never experienced certain climate changes that have happened, you know, like in the Southwest this, this year. We've had massive heat waves that have come through. Phoenix has had more 110 degree days this year than has ever happened. Woodland Hills, California, a few weeks ago hit 121 degrees. It's never happened. The forest fires that are currently burning throughout California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Utah, Nevada are also quite earth shattering in my opinion. And if you look at the satellite images of, of what's happening in the, the, the actual vast areas that are currently burning, it's shocking. And as an example, I believe someone just told me a statistic that 10% of Oregon is currently on fire. That is a shocking statement. One of the, the statements or the topics that I like to talk about is basically the lake levels of Lake Mead and the drought contingency plan uh, that was just signed uh, this past year for the state of Arizona. Um, you know, there is a plan and basically the seven states that receive water from the Colorado River had to come to an agreement on how much they can withdraw from that resource. You know, Lake Mead has a tier one restriction uh, level of 1075. We're currently a few feet away from that tier one restriction. For Arizona, as an example, the impact that it'll have is a 40% reduction in the available withdrawal from the Colorado River. What is scary about that is there's a number of entities that rely upon the Central Arizona Project and the water that's available from the Colorado River. Pinal County you know, uh, will experience a massive impact, especially to the agricultural production. I've, I've heard someone tell me uh, recently the impact is probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue from basically fallow land farms that just won't have water. It's not just the farmer or the, the processing people right there that are affected. There's a whole domino effect downstream that happened from the, the actual packagers, distributors, truckers, you know, everybody is affected because you have areas that basically won't have water uh, to facilitate the agricultural production. And so there's a, there's a huge impact downstream of all of the related industries that are going to be affected by that and a direct impact to the consumer because without those available areas growing low cost produce, the price point of the uh, fruits and vegetables will go up and, and all of the related products. You know, when we grow corn and wheat and these other elements, that affects not just the standard uh, produce on the shelf, but all of the other consumer products that we like to have uh, in, as well as ethanol and, and other elements that even go beyond that. There's another report that I'd like to reference, and again, it's made up of hundreds of scientists and, and specialists that, that really work to look at climate conditions, climate change, where we will tend to go over the next four years. Every four years, they do a, a new uh, uh, version of the National Climate Assessment. The last one, uh, which came out in November of 29, uh, 2018, basically uh, talked about the Southwest entering into a drier period, uh, a drier state. And, and that's something that we need to be aware of. We have, again, significantly increasing population densities in Southern California, in the Phoenix market, in Las Vegas, uh, in Denver, 
in Salt Lake City, and yet we have diminishing water resources. So we're really at a crux right now in that we have less water with higher population density. So it's, it's definitely a dangerous recipe. If we need to look at what's called the water energy nexus. The water energy nexus is, is a, basically a tie between water and energy production. You need water to make energy, and you need energy to make and clean water. And so they're, they're inextric inextricably tied together. This was actually mentioned to me by one of the U.S. Energy Security Council members that told me this is something that we have to understand, that water, energy, and food are all mutually t tied to each other. And we need to be aware that, that everything touches on, on the other. People always ask me what I do, and, and I always like to say that I'm an environmentalist, and I am. I work with power plants, I work with mine sites, I work with large industrial manufacturers, and I like to tell people that we can make significant gains and reductions in the existing infrastructure if we use technology to help mitigate that, that uh, the, the resources we consume. So for example, if a power plant is in a cooling tower that they have to have, to basically uh, generate the steam and then recapture that water. If they could just increase it by a few cycles of concentration, basically the number of times they reuse the water, we could save billions of gallons. And these are, in most cases, potable drinking water that's being used in these, these industrial and commercial processes. So I was, I was really uh, happy to hear that the state of Nevada, for example, and the Southern Nevada Water Authority instituted a rebate program this rebate program offers a $15 per thousand gallon rebate um, savings, basically a credit back to the, the, the consumer, the, the, the user of this water. It really is a great incentive. And someone was talking to me earlier about how we can actually get industry to do better on what they're doing. And technologies like ours uh, from Dynamic Water Technologies, we have a process to basically increase the number of cycles. There's a lot of other technology solutions, electrocoagulation and other methods of technology that has been advanced. I think agriculture in general could be benefit greatly by what some of the Israeli technologies have brought, brought about. One of them is uh, drip irrigation. It's not widely used in this country right now. We're too used to using flood irrigation sprinkler systems and other, other processes that, that lose a, a tremendous amount to evaporation. Whereas if we use the point source drip irrigation, this could save massive amounts of water. In Israel, they actually recycle over 90% of their water, which is tremendous. Um, most other countries, Spain, I believe, is the second most recycled water at 17%. And the United States, we recycle 5%. So if you think about how important this resource is to us, 5% recycling of this very valuable resource is not very much. It's one of those situations where if we truly valued water at the price that it was worth, we wouldn't waste a penny or a drop. We wouldn't waste any of it. It's, it's far too valuable, far too scarce, uh, far too precious. Imagine how scared you would be if you turned your faucet on and nothing came out. That's happened actually in some cities uh, around the country, uh, both in California and Arizona, there's a process called subduction or subsidence. And th these processes basically are the sinking, the physical sinking of the land due to withdrawals from the aquifer. In the Central Valley in California, they've actually seen areas sink as much as 30 feet over the last 100 years. It's a massive extraction of water from the aquifer or basins. And unfortunately, uh, Natural Geographic did an expose on this a number of years ago. They actually showed that the clay layers fully collapsed in the aquifer. Those clay layers took thousands, in some cases millions of years to actually develop. They've said that because they fully collapsed, they're permanently damaged. They're not coming back. You know, California, as an example, produces one fourth of all of the produce in the United States. And we think about how important that actually is to, to the U.S. I mean, water, which is the primary element that they, they really need, should be the most valuable thing that we're dealing with. And yet, it's really a second, nat or a second thought, you know, basically saying, oh, we'll never run out of water, oh, it'll rain again, the, the clouds will come back, yeah, maybe we'll have a couple of, couple of years of, of issue. You know, I wonder before the Dust Bowl happened uh, if they thought that too. And I believe that they did. I believe that they said, oh, it's just a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. You know, how long will it take to, to make a difference? Hopefully people start realizing it and recognizing the, the impact that we're currently having and, and we make strides to, to conserve and to, to recapture and to reuse. You know, I love that, I love the phrase reduce, reuse, recycle. You know, that, that concept 
is very logical to me and, and to most people I talk with. Do we care enough to take a few steps to conserve and, and, and preserve the resource that we currently have today for our children and for their children? Do we care enough and would we take the time uh, and would we implement the technology solutions today to conserve this resource for them? Because we're not gonna get free water. We're not gonna get this amazing resource just to discover. Um, when I look at, you know, I think about when I was a child and the, the talk about oil scarcity. And we've seen that they've discovered massive oil reserves and, and you know, other options and there's new energy technology coming out. Water, water is, is not something that we're likely to find this massive you know, global resource that is readily available. Desalinization and, and other related technologies are available, but we're finding they come at a very high cost for energy. They come at a very high cost economically speaking. They have a, an environmental impact. The, the brine water that's produced is degassed. And so now when they're discharging a lot of these brine solutions into harbors and in, into the, the uh, ocean, it's causing a lot of other environmental impact because it's killing certain aquatic life. I think that there's a, com a combination of opportunities where you have incentives, where you have these rebate programs like Henderson and, the, and Las Vegas have with the Southern Nevada Water Authority, when you have incentives that will help pay for technology solutions and you have technology solutions that fundamentally provide a net savings over traditional processing, that's a win-win. Just want to thank everybody for giving me the time to express some of my concerns and feelings on water and, and the preservation thereof. Uh, and really, hopefully this will bring to light some of the, the real concerns that are out there. The very smart people have written a tremendous amount on water scarcity and the realities of where we're at. And I would, I would hope that everyone would find it, I guess, be compelled to, to research this on their own, to, to read and, and view some of the, the literature and videos that are out there today and just make themselves educated on the topic of water and water scarcity.